Wondering how your mindset affects your life? How to bring more energy into your business and life? Millions of people around the world ask these same questions daily. You are in the right place. Learn practices that will help give your life the meaning and success you've been searching for. Welcome to the Charge Podcast, teaching you how to create habits around real goals every day. Practical life advice from those who made it. Here's your host, Gary Wilbers. Welcome to the month of March. It is already the third month of the year. Remember the goals you set out for yourself at the beginning of the year? Are you still committed to achieving them like you were on January 1st? Remember, goals are like having your headlights on, but you have to take action to accomplish them. We are sharing in the month of March some great guests on the Charge podcast. Our guests this month share their expertise on how to be a giver in your life, learn how to create revenue from e-commerce business, strategies to communicate with your clients, and why living into your passion is so important to living your best life. If you're feeling frustrated and stressed out with your professional and personal life, I know in each of these podcasts, the strategies that each guest shares can propel you to live a charged life in 2021. Chargers are committed to finding how each day they can make their life better by their willingness to learn, grow, and become the person they were meant to be. In my recently published book, Cultivate Positive Culture, 10 Actions to Faithful Living, I shared this quote, give yourself permission to charge each day to become the person you were meant to be. You've made a great choice in listening to this podcast. Remember, the podcast is named Charge after my mantra, create habits around real goals every day. Let's get recharged in this podcast to influence a positive culture so you can take simple positive actions each day. Are you ready? Welcome, Chargers. We're glad to have you back again this week for another great guest. I am so excited today because our guest is Lamar Hunt Jr. He has felt the weight and responsibility that comes with being born in opportunity. The Hunt family has a long history of entrepreneurship and investment in oil and petroleum, real estate, philanthropy, faith-based education, and perhaps most famously in sports. As the founder of the Laredo Companies, Lamar Hunt Jr. has created a vehicle in which he can help him use the resources to benefit others. The four Laredo Companies include Laredo Commercial, Laredo Sports Ventures, Laredo Properties, as well as the Laredo Foundation. Dedicated to helping build strong families and support communities, the Laredo Foundation is devoted to promoting the intrinsic dignity of all human beings, with a special focus on the poor and those who are underserved by society. Lamar Hunt Jr. believes that strong families come from strong communities and vice versa. The Laredo Foundation is concerned with programs that help and strengthen both while addressing the root causes of poverty and other social ills and promoting physical health, spiritual well-being, social good, emotional wellness, and economic prosperity. Today, Lamar Hunt Jr. remains active in a variety of charities across Kansas City, besides those offered through the Rolado Foundation. He continues to contribute to Catholic Radio Network, the Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas, and Read Across America, to name a few. He lives with his wife, Rita Mae Hunt, in their home in Leewood, Kansas, where they spend as much time as they can with their nine children and eight grandchildren. Lamar, it is great to have you on the Charge Podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's good to be here. Uh, Just really... Well said. I love that introduction. Uh, you can be my PR guy from going on forward. No, I'm teasing. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful life. Well, you've done a lot of great things, and that's what I really want to share is your really your gift of giving. Um, you, as you've said in the bio and some of the information I read, you really have understood what makes who you are. So one of my first questions is, Kind of where did that come from, and is some of that the profound impact with your father, or what was really that focused you and decided, okay, I want to be able to help. And the thing I love about it, it's not just give money. It's about really finding the root causes of what the problems are because money can't solve the problems. It's getting to the root issues. Right. It certainly is having a plan. Um, Gosh, yes, my dad was a very generous person. He was generous with his time 
certainly with his talent and with his treasure. And I, I know that's a cliche that people use a lot, but it, it really does matter. I, I would say the way we've come to look at it is to give up your substance. Um, a little bit like the widow's might in the gospel, and uh, that's an amazing moment of encounter. Um, but we, we try to figure out what really is needed in any given situation. We know we can't be all things to all people, but the idea is to be generous to a fault. Uh, it, some people sometimes think it's almost foolish, but it really isn't. Uh, but we do have to have a plan. I mean, charity in, in and of itself cannot just be like, I, I, I use this, allu uh, allude to this, peanut butter, you, it's nutritious and you can spread it everywhere, but we really, we need to be a little bit more um, judicious in how we approach it. And that's what we've done. We've tried to have an organized plan. Certainly we stay in certain lanes. I mean, that's another cliche that you hear these days, stay in your lane. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's an idea of, of, of generosity. And I really think it's perspective. You know, we can get stuck on ourselves so easily uh, with all these gifts, uh, whether they're, um, you know, the, the beautiful gifts of, of life, of travel. We were speaking a little bit about that earlier before we got on this podcast. But the, we have these beautiful things, but we really need to look at the perspective and look around. Uh, I've always been touched by one story uh, in the blind side when, when young Michael Orr is walking along the street, clearly homeless, and Lou Ann Tui his ado soon to be adopted mother says to her husband look around and there's this poor young black guy walking along the street who is just lost and uh, they ultimately befriend him and adopt him uh, take him in essentially um, and that that's kind of what we need to do is we need to look around and see what needs to be done and that's what that's really what generosity and charity is about yeah, and I think that's the key is, and you can really see it with the research that I've done um, on you, Lamar, and really the effect that you've had in so many different areas. And I know there's a saying that um, you have on your website says, to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. And you're able to give back to that community. And, you know, just with the conversations we've had, I can tell that is deep ingrained in you. And part of it is your faith. So I guess the question I have is, when you see some of the challenges out there, what makes you really decide, okay, we've got to look at some of these root causes, because if we change that, then we change really the dynamic for generations versus that initial step point. So the things we take for granted, uh, maybe you and I just sitting here talking, uh, learning to read and write and do arithmetic, uh, which matter by the way, a great deal, just the basic. Um, being in a home where there's some process of just learning how to, how life sort of unfolds, uh, we, we can take that for granted, but for some people, especially in this day and age, it's not that way, you know, uh, getting a good education or being introduced to even a relationship with God, uh, which is, I think, the greatest gift we can give to somebody is just to, however that happens, um, is something that we really need to, to pay attention to very carefully. It, the, you know, we use this term, I've heard it in football, you know, well, we, didn't, we, we, we lost the basics today. We didn't really block or tackle very well. And, uh, and that's true. And, and if we've lost sight of the basics, you know, for example, if you cannot read or write, what does that do to your own identity, your self-confidence, your confusion on how the wor world works? Uh, and, and then there's all sorts of things beyond that. I mean, of course, there's things like homelessness or going without food. I can't imagine that when when I was growing up, we just had everything there. And it wasn't it wasn't ridiculous. We we did live really regular lives and I'm I'm blessed to to say that about our family. Um, but we took things for granted and and then you again like I said earlier just looking around and saying this is what needs to be done. Um, but we need to focus on the things that we seem to be missing now in our culture more and more is just the basic things of reading, writing, arithmetic, how life works, reasoning through life, and faith and reason going together. I was uh, struck in the gospel, uh, not the, the readings this week have been in the, about Genesis, the, the, the Old Testament, and how whenever God introduces, for example, light, well, there's also darkness. So there's these sort of, they're complementary. It's not really meant to be a duality or opposing to each other. And the one I remember was the sheep and the oxen. Well, the oxen do all the work, and the sheep just stand there, and they get sheared, but we need both. Yeah. We need somebody to do the heavy lifting, but we also need the wool off that sheep and those different things. And, th and it's sort of interesting that with education, you need faith. 
You really do. The two go hand in hand. It's one thing to say, well, I want them to be smart and successful, but it's another thing I want my child or my children or my grandchildren to be wise, to have some wisdom. And the two go hand in hand, right? And that's kind of what I think we've been uh, missing in our culture. We've, we focused on, oh, well, they just got to get a great education and everything will be okay or whatever. But that faith component, that, that supernatural outlook at life, because life is full of contradictions, yeah. is really what, what's, what's, what we need to integrate, reintegrate into, cult, into our culture. Yeah, and it really becomes the foundational component for them, because if you don't have that foundational component, and that's hard for some of us if we've had that, that others don't have that. And, you know, just with the diversity right now that our world is going through, it's understanding there's two perspectives. And that's really exactly what you were saying with the Bible. It's given as that two perspectives. And I know with a lot of work that you're doing with the Laredo Foundation, you really, it's giving that opportunity to others that really don't have that opportunity. And I think I can really see through you how it excites you because it's not just a, a feeling of doing good. It's your changing, and then the other thing is, you know, that it's changing generations. Yeah, that's true. And I was I was sort of smiling while you were talking about that because something popped into my mm-hmm. head was today. You know, we have man, and then uh, in the Old Testament, then out of man comes a mm-hmm. woman, and and it was very clear that God said, "You need a woman's perspective on <laughs> stuff, dude. <laughs> you know, you ain't gonna get very far <laughs> without this woman's perspective." So yeah, it, it, it is true, and and that's the perspective we need to all have. I mean, one of the phrases that I've latched on to as I get a little older is the movement in our life is is really we tend to be selfish obviously and some degree of selfishness is correct and in place when we're younger you need to be selfish about doing your homework you need to be selfish about how you use your time wisely but then ultimately the movement is to selflessness you take that that sort of skill set maybe that you got by being selfish and share it with others and, and your gifts and talents. Yeah, and I think that becomes a real key. And as you know, my wife is in studio with us as we're cutting this podcast. And, you know, she really has been a backbone for me um, because I'll be honest, early in my career, it was about the success. Oh, yeah. And for chargers that's sitting there listening to you, I know you're chargers. But the thing is, don't lose everything you have for success. Plus, we could have a real debate now, you know, what is success? And what I find out is it's better to have significance because when we have significance in our life, then we truly make a difference with others as you're talking about. Yeah, and and if you know anything of Ignatius of Loyola, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the two standards, the first standard is, is the standard of the world. It's success, honor, power, riches. And then the second um, is really more the one of humility, disgrace, mm-hmm. you know, words that we don't want to hear, yeah. the, that we really don't want to hear about, you know, humiliation and all these sorts of things. But that those are actually the honors that we should not, not, not so much seek, but learn to accept even if we don't want them. Yeah. Well, let's go a little different route because as I did my research, you have studied music and mm-hmm. played flute in the Case Kansas City Symphony for 10 years. How do you believe your music has enhanced your life? Uh, well, that's a, gr- uh, a great question. You know, I, I have sort of in the last few years taken it back up, playing the flute. In fact, I'm playing at church on Sunday, uh, which is it's a beautiful blessing to be able to do that. I, I guess the way I would say music is I think music was the path that got me to a relationship with God. Mm. Yes, there are people, <laughs> plenty of people in, 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 in God moments that I didn't pay attention to. But I know from Aquinas, and this is just my brain working, uh, it's truth, beauty, and goodness that find our, our way to us. And one of those paths very often will lead you to God. And so is the beauty of music. Um, and the study of music and, and, and listening and, and appreciating and accomplishing and being allowed to accomplish that. It takes a lot of time, and it's a, you know, it's a protected environment to be able to practice an instrument. It's a lot of alone time, actually, a time with an instructor. Ultimately, you're introduced to playing with other people who play other instruments, like an orchestra or chamber music. Um, but I think it was the beauty of music. And I, I'm talking about 
great music. I, I love popular music, by the way, and I love country western, and I love jazz and things like that, but their classical music is music that ultimately is music that engages in a way that no other music does. And then I think I, when I was in music school, I, ha I was not Catholic, but I, we had to actually compose a mass the teacher in music theory had us, you know, take a simple, you know, we think of Gregorian Mass, that's Gregory the Great, yep. St. Gregory the Great is where it came from, but we actually had to put those words, and so, I, you know, I had taken a little Latin somewhere along the way and said, oh my gosh, I don't want to, <laughs> but you had to take those Latin words, Gloria, et cetera, Alleluia, all that sort of stuff, and put it into um, a Mass, and by the way, Kyrie is Greek, so yeah. <laughs> Kyrie eleison is actually the Greek. But, yeah. but my point is, is I think by studying that, by taking the time and pausing, I was introduced to the great, the great works of music, which include a lot of actually very deeply heartfelt religious music, like Bach's music or Mozart, or even Beethoven wrote one of the great masses. Um, and these composers were clearly touched by faith. Yeah, how that faith comes in and then how really that synergy comes because like you spoke about, you have to really practice on your own, but then you come together yeah. to really create the great music. And for leaders and chargers, as you're sitting there listening with your teams, are you creating something that is greater than yourself? Because when it comes together, as we've talked about with giving, well, it's also in the workplace. How can you make your workplace be different when you come together? And, and music, to me, is one of the things. I'm not very musical talented at <laughs> all. I will be the first one to say um, that part of it. That was not a gift God gave me. Um, but the thing is, it allows us to really understand it really affects both sides of our brain, and it really opens us up to other opportunities as life comes on. It does, and you can still appreciate the beauty, uh, even if even if you don't know exactly what you're listening to. Uh, again, classical music, if you want us to call it that, or that type of music, uh, has a, it has form, it has substance, it has coherency, uh, it has beauty. Uh, and and that it isn't just you know to manipulate you or to to, to bring home some sort of strange message <laughs> that some music has these days, but it's more uh, it, it it's, it's just the sheer beauty and force of beauty for almost for beauty's sake. But it's all uh, you know many of these composers wrote things for the glory of God. I mean yeah. that was their that was their mindset, and that's what I said earlier. They were, their education and and things like that. They were people of faith. I remember Mozart. We know a lot about Mozart because he was so smart, so young. Um, and he said when he prayed the rosary, the ideas came so fast to him, he could hardly write them down. Now, I, I don't think he's, you know, he's not going to be canonized a saint. I don't know. And don't go by the movie that you've seen about him, which has is, is, is got some truth to it. You know, he, was, he had a little ribaldry, yeah. as we would say. <laughs> he had a sort of, uh, you know, uh, sense of humor that uh, it could get a little dark. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but my point is, is that he, he took some inspiration from God. And when you see his manuscripts, and we're kind of going off on a tangent, he, they're flawless. It's like he was literally taking dictation. Whereas yeah. if you see Beethoven's manuscripts, there's much more work put into them, yeah. much more struggle, and his life was a struggle. Beethoven's life was a struggle, including a great sacrifice he made when he was 16 to, to, to help with another family member. But, but, but the, point, the point is, is that, you know, if, if we can help people develop that sense of something outside of themselves that's maybe greater than themselves, and that you can bow to that and say, okay, I just need guidance that will change people's lives. It really will. And, you know, you were talking about people going into the workplace. That's the idea of what the power of prayer or reflection is, is setting aside time that is alone time so that you bring that, hopefully, insight, that inspiration to your workplace. But if you're always just running and going and, and giving that sense that you're just going to be busy all the time, you're not going to get much done. Yeah, and let's hope one thing that comes out of the whole COVID thing is, is people realize having a little more time for themselves can be a good thing. Oh, yeah. We don't want it as much as what we've had. Right. But what can we do in having that time? And I think we talked last time I've had guests, the number one thing that people say is one of their habits is having some sort of morning ritual that allows them to get their day started and allow them to move forward each and every day. And it doesn't have to be mine's an hour. Yours could be 10 minutes. It's just having that time that you're really, some of it is for us, it's spiritual that we have that time there. 
but where you're taking some time to slow down and thinking about what do you want this day to be? Yeah, one of the great coaches that I've, I've seen, I've seen a lot of good football coaches. In fact, Marty Schottenheimer just passed. And uh, just a, a, a wonderful coach, a wonderful person, a wonderful family, and quite a journey for them with the Alzheimer's. But Herman Edwards, uh, who is, I think, the coach now of Arizona State, was an NFL coach for a number of years. Um, you know, he, he, he's actually, I think, a convert to the Catholic faith. And uh, he says, I did 15 minutes each day with the scripture because he's a busy guy. Um, but it said it really settles him down. And so to your point, it, it's going to be different for everybody. Not everybody is necessarily capable of doing a holy hour. Right. But you, if you think about calling the mind to God during the day in small moments, you can, it can end up being about an hour. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be something just sitting in a chair because that's, that's not necessarily easy. But, but it, there's something to that, too, just taking time. I was going to say one thing. During this uh, COVID, especially in the early part last March and April, I read a book by John Grisham, and he's a very talented writer, and he's, he, he works to help people who are unjustly accused to this, to this day. He does a great work with that. But he wrote a book called The Confession, and in it is a character who's a, a young man who's unjustly accused of murder. He's on death row, and he gets in there, and he's in despair because he's, he's in isolation, and he develops a thing called the routine. And he's a young man. He's like in his early, maybe late teens or early 20s. And he does this thing called the routine where he, he begins to work out. He begins to read. He begins to write. He begins to, you know, correspond with people. He tries to do it because he's alone 23 hours a day. And we can't, you can't imagine. And I would imagine that this is all based on usually real life experiences. But this, the, he, he calls it the routine. And I sort of related to that in the COVID that we do have to have some routine. And maybe that the blessing of sort of standing back and saying, okay, I'm in time out a little bit here. I've got to come up with some structure and a routine. It can be, it could be some exercise. It could be, you know, the power to just sit and pray and reflect on your day, to plan, to pray over your day. Yeah. The Jesuits do that very well. They pray over your day, prayer before you go run off and do stuff, <laughs> contemplation before action, right? And I, and I think that's, that's the blessing that we need to look in this is saying, what is God? Well, he's asking us to slow down and notice. Yeah, so. I think you're exactly right there. <laughs> kind of interesting, you have a Master of Arts degree in counseling mm -hmm. and a focus on cognitive behavior therapy. So as a licensed professional counselor, you worked at risk with at-risk teens, homeless individuals, and people who are re recovering from addictions and trauma. What did you learn from that experience? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I learned is a, a perspective, which is what we've kind of talked about here is, wow, you think you've been through some things in your life and then you encounter people who in some ways their stories have been kept inside of them, uh, especially those who've been traumatized and you, and you, wow, you, you learn about what real empathy is or just to be something to listen um, it's not necessarily what I found in counseling is not advice giving. In fact, I remember learning that early from a, a skilled counselor. He said, you're not really here to give advice. You're here to help listen. And then it is perspective, help them change their perspective. Many people who seek out counseling, um, Hey, listen, it's, it's from the heart. They want help. Um, but many times they're angry. They can be angry, very angry, a ball of anger and rebelliousness, and sometimes are forced into counseling. Yeah. Other times they're very depressed, forlorn. They've given up on their lives. And really the, the, the world where you want to get them, the road you want to get them on is how can you accept what's happened even though it was unfair, unjust, you would never have chosen it. Because otherwise, you're going to remain in those other places of tremendous anger, lashing out at the world or family or broken relationships or just inactivity, just lethargy, um, depression, uh, the philosopher's angst or, fa you know, fate. This is my fate and I can, I can, I don't, I really nothing, I have no power to do anything. And so, it, but once we, we all, ha and we all go through this, there's things about our lives, no matter how 
blessed we are, <laughs> uh, you, you have, there's acceptance. You know, we're, we're parents here. You know, maybe a child isn't walking the same faith journey that we walked or whatever. Or they're, they're away from going to church or this or that or whatever it may be you want for their faith life. Or even worse, right? R- to real rebellion. Yeah. Um, we've all experienced that as parents because, um, one, we did it ourselves perhaps, <laughs> and that's how we can relate. But but you know that that is that's that's so incredibly important to get down and be patient and understand the world is going to set you full fill you full of contradictions and how do you deal with the contradictions of life i can remember in 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 school people saying things like that's not fair that's not fair they cheated and i i could have been the one being not fair i could have been the one who cheated <laughs> you know I, I mean i was yeah. and or, or they did the same thing and, and but Life is part of that. Now, how you resolve it is, is the more, more important things, how you come to deal with it. But anyway, yeah. so you get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that because I think it shares with, you know, kind of your basis of really the foundational component of why you really kind of like digging into more of the root cause um, that's out there. As we kind of wrap up and before we go to the recharge round, Lamar, because I know I could have a conversation for a couple of hours with you, but <laughs> listeners won't listen that long. So that's the only challenge. They may come back I and, get it. <laughs> and on that part of it because we are on urgency of that time. Sure. What would you tell someone that's listening to the podcast? Because how can they go out and impact their communities and make that difference? Because sometimes it's the small, simple things. What would you tell someone that's listening? They're hearing your story, but then how could they impact and put that to their story? So each of us is wonderfully and uniquely made. And we each have a call placed on our lives. And some of that is very basic stuff. If you're married, you're married and, and try to be a good husband, good wife. Um, one of the phrases from the Psalms comes to mind, Lord, set a guard over my mouth <laughs> for <Yeah>. husbands, <laughs> for sure. I would give that to the men out there, set a guard over your mouth. <laughs> and, and behind every successful man is a surprised woman. <laughs> but, but, what, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things I would say in, in, in all of this is everyone's uniquely called. So I used the phrase earlier, look around, and you don't need to go way outside your community. Mother Teresa actually had people come over to India thinking, well, I want to work with the poor, and she would send them back and say, go down your street and just look down your street and work with people on your street or in your neighborhood. So it could be something very, very basic like helping someone to read, become a mentor. I know guys and gals that mentor students at some of the, what we would call the inner city high schools. But what a difference if you spent an hour a week uh, or things like that. My wife has volunteered at a parish for many years. She just goes and helps with the sort of front office stuff. Um, you know, she doesn't do that now, but she did it for a number of years. She got to know the priest. She got to know the parish. She got to know the people, but she was just present. Uh, I, I would say she has a great gift of hospitality, yeah. you know, uh, something that the Benedictines are so wonderful at, uh, you know, talking to. And so it's looking around right within your own niche. You're not going to change the world the way you think you're going to change the world. That is given over to some people. You know, for example, there was only one John the Baptist. He literally lost his head for the Lord, <laughs> right. right? We're not all going to be Maximilian Colby where we get to smile our way through a concentration camp through people beating you up. Um, an amazing story there. But we, we do have that call of sanctity within the ordinary life that we lead. And, and yes, we may r- brush up against um, scorn or disdain or people saying, well, you're, you're a Christian. Oh, by golly, you know, I'm going to persecute you. You, I, okay, but you know we, we need to still find that peace and joy. But there are little things out there, as Mother Teresa said, little things done with great love is yeah. really something we need to think about. And that's where I would encourage you is just take action because when you're helping others, what ends up happening is you get more in return. And we all know that's a saying, but it's so true. If you're having a tough time right now, we're early in 2021, but you're it's not going as you expect it. 
go help someone else and you'll see that you'll end up seeing it differently than you did before. And I really encourage you to do that as we go forward. Now, I've got a few recharge questions that I'd like to ask you. We call it the recharge round. Um, The first one is my model is charge. And of course, that's what the podcast is. It's create habits around real goals every day. What is one of your habits that you think's made the biggest difference in your life? Um, gosh, I, I would say absolutely what changed for me when I started praying basically the first thing of the day. I, I, I've got kind of a tricky back as I've gotten a little older. I've got to do some certain stretches. But once I get past that 10 minutes, I sit down and I just take a morning meditation. I'm always pretty organized about that, and I just – Read right now. I'm reading some meditations by Cardinal Henry Newman, John Saint John Cardinal Henry Newman. He's got all these, <laughs> um, yeah, right. but you know, and they're a page and a half to two pages, and he's you know, he's a saint. He's speaking to you personally. Uh, it always starts with you know, put yourself in the presence of the one who's already present. <laughs> 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 Which oh, I think yeah, he, that's he had a, a pretty one. interesting sense of humor. <laughs> you know, like he's already here. You just need to get here with him. <laughs> So I, I would say prayer. I, I would say some form of exercise is is really important. It doesn't need to be fanatical or anything like that. But uh, there's a book I've been uh, read called Seven Pleasures. It does, and those pleasures are not watching TV or going to the movies. It's things like walking, swimming, listening, reading, writing, things you know, playing, yeah. uh, playing with kids, losing yourselves in those moments without trying to have to be occupied by a screen or a phone or things like that. So maybe the better way to say it is to sort of limit that screen time. It's necessary. we got to use it. It's a great tool, whether it's your email or messaging or you know, somebody calling you. But to try to let, have less screen time so that you can spend more time listening and loading up for the day. As you say, charge, get charged for the day. But I'd say quiet time. (laughs) Yeah, I agree with you. It's quiet time and just allowing yourself some of that space Mm -hmm. and let you determine what that is. I have several things that I talk about when I go out and speak. And one of them that I'm going to ask you now is like with your mindset. How do you believe your mindset affects your daily living? Um, Well, first off, noticing it. Hmm being awake yeah. uh, to it. Um, I, I'm a big fan of St. Teresa of Avila and the Seven Mansions, and that was another book I got through mostly. I didn't get to the, s- the later mansions. <laughs> uh, I'm still working. I'm still knocking around in the first couple of mansions. But self-awareness. Yeah. That for, for, First off, the first thing you say to somebody in the day, I mean, if you're married out there, hug your wife. I know I can see when my wife gets up and she's worried about this or that or, you know, a kid or a grandkid. And if I just hug her, it, it, she melts. Not because it's necessarily me, but it just sort of takes the stress off of her. And, and so I, I just think noticing your own mindset, but then giving something to somebody else quick as quickly as you can makes a big difference. Great advice. What do you do? You talked a little bit about exercise and um, that's there. But what do you do to bring energy into your life? Is exercise one of them? And, of course, we know yeah. your morning routine is part of that because you're charged up, ready to go there. Yeah, exercise makes a big difference for me. It really does. Um, I, I think it burns off excess calories <laughs> as you get a little older. <laughs> I was telling you earlier I was swimming this morning. I try to swim Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays. I've gotten to know a guy named Ed who swims. He's 71. He swims probably three times further than I do, <laughs> and he's in terrific shape. But you can just tell it, 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 the exercise makes a difference. I mean, our body, we're made in a body. Our bodies are meant for use. We are more sedentary than we used to be. Mm-hmm. We really are. I mean, even as I think about what I did as a kid or even in college, walking all the places we walked, you know, we get locked into a desk and a screen and we sit and then it's too cold or whatever. But you've got to be very intentional about some form of exercise. Move Movement, movement, because yeah. I think motion is the lotion, right, for, for getting us getting us to, to, to be like Ed and swim 2,200 yards. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Four days a week. But, but, but you, you could tell it with him, just 
he, his mindset for the day is, you know, today we were talking. He said, I got to go. I got to go. And I said, well, you're retired. He goes, I got things to do. I got yeah. things. He was charged up. That, so, yeah. you know, but I do, I, I do think exercise is important. And I, I think we, we know that message from our culture. It cannot become a cult of exercise or a, a thing of vanity or things like that. You know, I want to look good in clothes or this or that. that that's, that's silliness, yeah. especially when you get older. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's more a, a, about our bodies are meant to be used for activity. Activity. I still am a big fan of working in the yard in the summer. I can't wait to get back out and get some of that going again. Um, yeah, it becomes a real key because it really allows you additional energy. Most people don't realize if you haven't been exercising for a while, you'll say, well, that's going to take energy. And what I always tell my people that I talk to is actually what you'll see, you'll actually have more energy to do the other things that you want to do when you start that. And since we're early in 2021, some people tried to start it. They've failed. Well, just get started. And it can be a very simple thing. It can be walking, you know, probably not outside right now because no. it's pretty freezing cold. But you can go somewhere and do that walking and just get yourself started and moving, like you said. And there's a guy, Dr. Ray Garendi on Catholic Radio, who's really a treat to listen to. And he's adopted a bunch. Of, he's just an amazing counselor type guy and he said you know he's talking about new year's resolutions and he said stop making them because he said what's going to happen is you know there's going to be a lapse then there's going to be a relapse and then there's going to be a collapse <laughs> and i thought that was very very yeah, funny but, but his point was don't let a lapse or even a relapse lead to the collapse and that's the same thing true about our prayer lives hey i, I miss prayer today or i didn't quite I didn't get to pray the rosary or whatever. And those are important, by the way. That is important. But don't beat yourself up and just collapse and say, well, gosh, I'm done with that. It just yeah. didn't work out. And I think the same thing is true about any routine that I mentioned earlier. Exercise is one of them. If you miss a day of walking, you miss a day of walking. If you miss a day of whatever your you know, chosen exercise, it's, it's okay. So get back in the saddle. Yep. <laughs> Do it now. Yeah. What advice has influenced you the most in your life? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, a couple of things. I'll, I'll use one from my stepfather. I'll use one from my father, and then I'll use one from Steve Covey. Covey. Um, from my stepfather, um, I was watching him one time, and we were driving on a country road. He was a farmer. Uh, he, not by choice at this point. I mean, he grew up around. He would have preferred to have been an engineer. But we're driving around South Texas, and he flips on the signal on the car, and he turns right. I'm looking around, and I'm like 13. I said, well, there's nobody around. Why did you flip on the signal? He goes, it's a habit. It's a good habit. <laughs> okay, so habits matter. Yep. Okay, he was doing it maybe unthinkingly. He's in the middle of nowhere, you know, on these <laughs> farm roads. Okay, with my dad, um, and this is something that's fantastic, is just his loyalty, um, maybe to a fault, but we all, but just his loyalty to the original ownership group in the American Football League. You know, there was an opportunity for him actually to jump ship at one point. They were going to take seven teams. We were going to take actually four teams into the NFL. They only had seven in the AFL. Minnesota had defected, if you will, the Vikings. Justice that we beat them in that Super Bowl <laughs> four. But, but my point is, he said, no, we're going to find an eighth team and we're going to play as the American Football League. And that was an act of courage for him to do that because he could have just said, yeah, we'll just take the four and the other three will tell them to, to go away. He found the, the eighth team, which was the Oakland Raiders. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so his loyalty there uh, was, a, I think it was a tremendous asset in his life. He, was, he had a great sense of perseverance about him. He really did, uh, and that, that's a, that was something very honorable about him. And the last one is Steve Covey is basically seek to understand rather than to be understood. It's yeah. principle number four. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, I'm mean, giving a lot of opinions and yeah. thoughts and, and, and ideas here, but, but really to spend more time listening, mm -hmm. seeking to really understand rather than to be understood. Yes, you could say that came from a counseling world, but I, I think that's great advice for anybody in business is to try to get that other perspective. Even if you don't ag agree with it totally or you say, maybe we could have done this another way, um, but, but to really try to understand that person because you, you give them validity. And actually, it's a moment where we can both learn yeah. from each it other. Be, yeah, it becomes a key one. I yep. love that one with Stephen Covey. Recommend a book. I know you're a reader, um, and <laughs> share am. why you love it. 
Well, I, you know, I just go to where I'm, what I'm doing now. There's a book called A Man for Others by uh, Patricia Treese, written in 1982 about St. Maximilian Kolbe, and it's apparently the greatest book written about him. I mean, there's great books written by him, but what she's able to do is compile firsthand accounts of people that were with him uh, in the prison camp and worked with him, actually. There they were people like that might have been a friar, that, that uh, Franciscan friar that discovered they didn't have a vocation and they grew up later. And, be, and she's found all these people and she pulls all these things to sort of give eyewitness moments. So that's one I'm reading. Um, and then the other one that I want to start is by uh, about Eric Lindell, the great uh, runner from Chariots of Fire, the movie. But really, we know he was the fastest man in the world. We know he didn't run the 100 meters on that Sunday because it was a violation of the Sabbath and he was not going to work. He still went the 400 meters and won. But what he did the next 20 years of his life after he won the gold medal in those Olympics is he was a missionary. And I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. that. And we'll have that in the Charge podcast notes where you can get links to those. Um, It's always interesting when I ask someone that because when they're a reader, of course, we always go back to our current ones because that's where we're at right now because it's hard to – we read so much that's there. So I really challenge the Chargers to check into that. My last question, Varya, is if you had to sum up your legacy in one sentence or less, what would you want it to be? Uh, it's a beautiful question um, because I do think we do think about legacies. Um, he was a good father. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, it's a good father in multiple ways. I'm sure that Lamar's thinking from what we've already discussed. So think about that for yourself. Are you a good father? Are you a good mother? Are you that good person? And are we living our life the way we want to live? Chargers, of course, are charging after things. But the thing they're willing to do, and that's why you're listening to this podcast, you're willing to hear other people's perspectives and decide what's missing in my life. And hopefully from our conversation that we've had today, I can't thank Lamar enough for saying yes to this podcast, is you really have some perspective that you can really do some reflection, hopefully tomorrow morning and spend some of that quiet time to get there. Lamar, thank you so much for being on the Charge Podcast. Thank you so much, and um, I know you call them Chargers, and we think that's a great name, (laughs) but Chief's Kingdom, baby. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. The Chief's Kingdom is definitely better, so we may have to look at that switch to where we've got to make it. So Chargers, make it a great day, and I will see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us. This podcast has ended, but your life doesn't just stop. To continue your inspiring journey, head over to chargepodcast.com and access all the tools and resources mentioned on today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing with somebody who may also benefit from the advice provided. That's chargepodcast.com. Until next time, charge in business and life.